I was addicted to methamphetamine. Heroin addiction and probably every other drug known to man. I was addicted to... Crystal meth. Ice. Methamphetamine and, and alcohol. alcohol. Meth. Cocaine. Alcohol and before that Alcohol and amphetamines. Heroin. My addiction was meth, meth alcohol and marijuana. It's tough. It's been tough. This is the West Swan Valley Road in the Swan Valley. It's about a half an hour drive east of Perth. Peter Lyndon James and Shalom House have got four properties along this stretch of highway. It's a huge operation, thousands of square metres devoted to the business of rehabilitation. And in one of the great ironies of the Shalom House story, this area is slap bang in the middle of the Swan Valley wine region. Per square kilometre, it's probably one of the most booze soaked areas of Australia. You don't look like your average drug rehab counsellor. OK, that's cool. For a large part of your life, you're actually a pretty bad man. I wasn't... I wouldn't say bad, but I'd done bad things, yeah, but I wouldn't say I was a bad fellow, but... Yeah, done bad things. In 2001, I was doing two and a half kilo a day of meth. My mate, Crash, is dead now. He got seven years for one ounce, and I'm selling 32 ounces a day, you mean? That would make you one of Australia's more prolific drug dealers. Yeah, it was pretty scary, in a sense. I got out of jail and thought I'd just sell drugs for a living and not do hot goods or anything, and I didn't realise, but I went really big really quick. Peter Lyndon James has an impressive rap sheet. He started working on it in primary school and quickly became one of Australia's most prolific child criminals. Spent all my birthdays from the age of nine up to 18 in juvenile detention centres, prisons. I was institutionalised. And um, I got up one morning after 16 days no sleep and I had TRG come through the front and back with shotguns, pulled pretty fast, had a helicopter over the roof. And I just remember my wife laying in the middle of the hallway with our uh, six-month-old son with a shotgun to her head. And I just hated who I was, you know, and I got charged with um, intent to sell and supply and um, possession of firearms and some other stuff. Can you put this kind of stuff behind you? Yeah, yeah I, I reckon you can, I have. Peter's moved on from his life of crime. Guns and drugs replaced by sermons and Bibles. So how do you end up the head of Australia's biggest rehab service? Yeah, that's a good one, isn't it? Shalom House is not your typical rehab. It's run by the addicts. There are few second chances. Well, we can't be bothered. I can't be bothered. See you later. No excuses and a lot of hard physical labour. Guess when we needed some muscles, eh? <laughs> it's overflowing. Around 160 residents crammed into a handful of houses in what most Australians would say are primitive living conditions. But for most who come here, it's better than life on the street. Family want nothing to do with me. Uh, friends want nothing to do with me. My problem was with meth and heroin. So I'm a heroin addict and a meth addict. Hundreds of people who have burnt every bridge in their lives have come here over the past 12 years. Relatively few make it through the gruelling five-step recovery program. You need help. You need help. That's why you come here, because you don't need help. Step inside and you'll find meth-addicted accountants and alcoholic kindergarten teachers living and working alongside heroin traffickers, professional thieves and the underworld's hardest gangsters. Riz Yacoub is one of Shalom House's strongest supporters. It's a bizarre U-turn in life for an ex-sword boy gang member who spent years as one of Australia's most wanted. I've been done with manufacturing explosives, um, possession with intent to sell supply, unlawfully wounding public officers, you name it, burglaries, frauds, smuggling. I've been done with a number of very serious offences. But you're obviously quite good at it. I was very good at it. That's the sad part. But I realised that if I if I uh, sort of adapted myself in this life with the same energy that I had in that life, and getting qualified in 2019 as a drug and alcohol counsellor, it was about getting people out and not putting them in prison, but actually helping them to reassess their lives and, and direction. 
instilling a solid work ethic is central to Shalom's rehabilitation model and the reason Peter Lyndon James doesn't need a government handout. When they're not working on the inside, ensuring residents are fed and clothed, the army of recovering addicts is out in the community working at one of Shalom's profit-generating businesses in furniture removal, landscaping and hardscaping. Work is a huge part of the rehab process at Shalom House. Well, of the 160 people you have, how many are working? Well, everybody works Monday to Friday, nine to five. The holistic program is about setting a routine, getting up in the morning, brushing your teeth, having a shower, having brekkie, put on your fluoro, just go to work for the day, and you're conditioning your body. A lot of them have never worked. They've been on the dole for 20 odd years, you know, and so it's like all their bones ache, and you know, but they just learn and work within your capacity. I'm Corey. I'm 16. My addiction was marijuana. The meth, heroin, alcohol. Prescription drugs and ice. You've got a very big business supporting the whole operation. So what's your annual turnover? I never looked at it. People, I, 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 I'm not interested in making money. I make people and 100% of the income that comes in, um, it pays for the staff, um, 70 vehicles. I think last we paid 560,000 bu bucks in rent on properties but the money that's in the bank, it belongs to the residents. So they get their teeth fixed, we buy them cars, we pay off some of their bills. While Peter says he doesn't know the number, it's published. Shalom House turned over close to $5 million last year, a lot of the revenue coming on the back of its residents. Critics say it's slave labour, but considering some residents have never had jobs, you could see it as much needed training for life. So they come to you and they basically give you complete charge over their lives. That's correct, everything. That's a huge responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, so they sign a power of attorney, which gives us uh, permission to act on their behalf. We make sure that we tell them everything we're doing. The second that they choose not to be a part of the program, then that becomes null and void. Each resident pays $300 a week. Initially, that usually comes from Centrelink, but as people recover, learn some basic skills and start working for a wage at Shalom's businesses, they pay their own way. As they work through the five stages of the program, a process that can take at least one year and up to three, they reclaim control over parts of their lives. By the final stage of recovery, they're pretty much living as regular citizens in their own homes, holding down regular jobs. Been in Shalom 11 months now. 12 months, 51 weeks and three days. Eighth day today. Even the hardest work is not enough. Shalom House makes no secret that it's a faith based rehabilitation centre. But for some residents, it's a sudden and confronting introduction to Peter Lyndon James's personalised brand of Christianity. Good morning, Generation City. How you doing? You're doing good, fantastic. Why don't we stand to our feet this morning? Praise God. So let us sing, let us praise the King of Kings this morning. Let us bring him glory, let us bring him praise in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let's give him all the glory today. Well, we ask, Lord God, that you help us to be the best us we can be and go ahead of us today, go ahead of us the week, and yeah, just help us to grow and to change and see what we can't see. And we love you and we praise you. We thank you, Dad, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there's a passage in Scripture that says, the wisdom of God or the counsel of God or the instruction of God is in the heart of a man and a woman and a person of understanding draws it out that I am the great shepherd of the sheep. My sheep know me, they hear my voice. It's not about religion, it's about a relationship with a living God that has a plan and a purpose for your life. Christian or non-Christian, everybody hears God's voice. Here's your conscience. Uh, you're about to make a decision and you feel on this side, oh, well, I shouldn't really do that. But then you hear this other voice, oh, go on, you're not going to hurt anybody. The voice that's trying to warn you, that's his voice. But I've always said, if, if a person rings up, they're at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom, and they'll do whatever it takes to change their life. Do you turn them away or take them in? Take them in. Shalom. Um, 
you have complete control over their lives, you force them to become Christian, you send them out to work, you hold that money in trust and don't give it to them for up to two years. Some people might say that sounds like a cult. Where'd you get all that from? That's like a hoggly pop. I thought you were a reporter. I've got to take him in and we'll just make more room. Dr Stephen Bright is a psychologist who has spent his career in the alcohol and drug treatment sector. Do you think Shalom House is a cult? I think Shalom House um, has elements of, of cultish type behaviours to it. People are required to shave their heads, they're required to go to church three times a week. But I, I wouldn't call it a cult per se. It's a treatment community that's a bit different than, than the typical treatment communities that people are, are generally accessing um, that are government funded because it's not government funded. Peter is a former heroin addict, meth dealer, bikey associate, standover man who had a hopeless addiction to drugs. He looks at academics like you and thinks, what would you know? I've spent most of my career working in the alcohol and other drug treatment sector as a psychologist, assisting people who are experiencing their own problems um, similar to, to Peter. I've also done a lot of work in harm reduction and I've wanted to engage and, and help people in a way um, that's evidence-based, that's based on the best evidence that we have and in a way that's not going to do people any harm. If you're a professor of addiction, you've obviously got a lot of knowledge that could help me to be better. You need to take the time, humble yourself, come out, have a look over the program. But ultimately, at the moment, anybody can set up an alcohol and other drug treatment service. It's important that there's some sort of accreditation, some sort of regulation um, to protect people. Get any rehab, there's a three to six month wait list. Everywhere. It's clean piss test for three months before they take to a rehab. Now, yes, that's impossible for a drug addict. I'm more than happy for even yourself, anybody, to come over and pull me apart. So you'd be happy for us to live at Shalom House? Yeah. Please, um, just tell it as you see it. Meth and oh, marijuana addiction meth. for 28 Fantastic. years. Addicted to meth and methamphetamines. I was on meth for over 10 years. My addiction was, was addicted meth to meth alcohol and methamphetamine. I was addicted to alcohol and, and methamphetamines. Uh, but those first few days, those first few weeks, um, you're emptying out and you hurt. I am going to go through this program like anyone else would. I'm going to have my induction shortly. I'm going to have my head shaved. I'm going to have a health test. I'm going to have a urine test. Make sure that I'm in a fit state to actually be in the facility. I will be eating, working and living with people who are doing Australia's toughest rehab. Little bag search. Make sure you're not trying to bring anything in. People do struggle. They struggle with giving us their phone. We have to take their phone, um, their ID, everything. Because you know, a journalist without a phone is pretty much just an idiot that doesn't have <laughs> much to do. Just do it, great. Shaving your head is a way to bring everyone to the one level. It doesn't matter if you're a white collar professional who picked up an addiction to oxy after a knee operation or a hardened underworld operative in the meth trade. You all start the same. Sleeping eight in a room with addicts, some of whom are still coming down from whatever gave them their fix, tests everyone. Even someone who comes in clean. This is a tough life. <sighs> so my first night at Shalom House, everyone says you don't sleep very well in the first couple of nights and I weren't lying. It doesn't matter how hard everyone tries to be quiet, there's 16 guys in one house, and it's a pretty small house. I think being constantly tired keeps your mind off other things. For many residents, the day starts before 5am. In early stages, they need to shave every morning. It's one of many routines built into each day, designed to prepare people for life back in society. I was addicted to uh, meth, alcohol and cannabis. Addicted to methamphetamine and GHB. And my addiction is methamphetamines. I'm at an area known as The Block. It's where they bring all new intakes for the first four weeks. It's basically 
four weeks of hard graft. And for many people that first arrive at Shalom, they've never worked before. And so it's a bit of a shock to the system. If they have worked, it's often years ago before their addictions completely overwhelm their life. Des O'Reilly is a de facto foreman. Hi, my name's Des. I'm 45 years old and I've been with Shalom for four years. This former drug addict standover man now commands respect and is notorious for running a tight ship. Anyone else heard anything they need to bring? Yeah, I, I got something else to bring. Uh, I was addicted to heroin and meth for 25 years. You know, Ben Harvey might be here, but he's just another bare bum in the shower as far as I'm concerned. I'm on. And obviously directed towards the guys that are on my team today, but the group as a whole as well. I don't want to see anybody pandering to the camera or standing around. There's no tough guy poses. That today doesn't exist, all right? Especially for us, after this breakfast this morning, we got a job to do and there'll be no stuffing around. Good. Does anybody else have something they'd like to bring? All right, Brent, I'll go get the keys. Yep. You organise your man, look after this pelican, I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I've interviewed contract killers and bikey chiefs and drug cartel heads, and this guy, Des, just scares the shit out of me more than them. Today's job, landscaping and fencing at a local primary school. Ben Harvey, can I have a word to you for a second, please? Des is quick to let people under him know if they're out of line. We have a leadership structure here in Shalom for a reason. Um, Brett's got to keep an eye on all the men. That's that's his job that he does for me as 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 the one I see on the truck. And uh, with you constantly wandering off away from him, you're making his role extremely difficult. Uh, so I want those cameras gone by the time I get back from picking up my my materials. Okay. Yep. Thank yes, you. Yes. So I just gave a quick apology to Brett, who is running the show at the moment, because that thing inside with Des wasn't the first one I copped today. And you see these guys, and they're doing this, and they're helping a local primary school. There's two dozen kids having fun at recess just there. Uh, and at some point in the next few months, they'll be looking out over a completely re-landscaped area, courtesy of five hopelessly addicted people. Uh, it's kind of strange to be here as an outsider who knows he's going to go home in a few days. Any critics of Shalom now should think, would you rather these guys fix up a local primary school or break into your house? Another day, another early morning wake up after another bad night's sleep. More shaving, more work, less space as new residents arrive. It's a monotonous, sometimes claustrophobic grind. There's a prayer before each meal and before and after every workday. All right, Father. Today, as we go about our day, just help us be the best us that we can be. Not only in the words that we speak, the thoughts that we think, and the decisions that we make. If we need to bring anything to our brothers here, just make sure it's in love. That's and, just uh, the start of the religious journey. Thirty minutes of personal Bible reading is followed by an hour of group discussion. Amen. I was addicted to methamphetamine. I was using methamphetamine and cannabis. And I was addicted to methamphetamine. The women and men of Shalom are segregated and discouraged from communicating. For many women, the mere presence 
of a man is intimidating. I'm in a part of Shalom House that's called the Linen Shed. It's where the 45 odd women who are part of this program come to work. I'm being a little bit quiet at the moment and just letting them get on with their business. Just the mere presence of a guy here is unusual and quite confronting for many of them. How many of these women have had bad experiences at the hands of men? All of them. Yeah. All of them. Dee Yacoub has lived a hard life. In 2009, I spent a year in prison for manufacturing amphetamines. I came in to work at Shalom House, but really had to dedicate my life to change. She's now using her experience to guide the women of Shalom. When you were a meth cook, did you ever feel a connection to God? Oh, no. Look, I was an atheist. Go ahead, ladies. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for being with us today as you are every day. I mean, one of their biggest concerns when they first come in here is, is my ex-partner going to be able to find me? Yeah. They're scared. They're scared, yeah. There are at least two women who we can't put on camera because their lives are in danger. That's the kind of stakes that get played with every day at Shalom House. Yeah, I mean, you've got to get past all of us first. And we're not going to let anyone in. So they, feel, they feel protected here? Yeah. Two years ago, Dee's mission at Shalom became more personal. Her daughter, Jewel, had followed her footsteps into the drug world. So I was invited to a party and it ended up being um, a halfway house, like a brothel. And I got offered ice that night. Um, and I came home the next Saturday. It was on Friday, I came home Saturday, realised how broken I was. I had bruises from my ankles up. Um, yeah, I didn't really know what happened the night before that. So yeah, I came into rehab on the Monday. I think that pretty, that scared me, yeah. So when I'm at work, I am actually not mum. That must be hard to do. It is hard to do, uh, but if we want our life to change, that's what we had to do. Do you think you'd be alive if you hadn't come to Shalom? I don't know where I'd be right now, yeah. The people who have signed their lives over to Peter Lyndon James have done so because he's the only alternative to jail, an emergency department, a psychiatric hospital or a morgue. Shalom House is like Australia's dirty little secret. The politicians and the bureaucrats that decide what happens with these drug rehab centres and where they're not allowed to operate are sending their kids here. I'm recovering from alcoholism, benzo addiction and meth addiction. The opiates and heroin. I was addicted to methamphetamine and alcohol. This is Riverview Church in Perth, South East. It's one of the bigger congregations in the city. It's about a thousand people in there at the moment, including the boys from Shalom. For many Australians, the sight of people singing with their arms in the air at a church is a little uncomfortable. And a lot of people will be thinking that sounds and looks like a cult. After seven days, I gotta say, if Shalom is a cult, it's not a very good one. They don't want people to stay for a long time. They want them to get better, to get functioning, and to get on with their lives. They need the beds. Ours is planning issue. We just need someone to tell us where to go. You know? I mean, where do I put 160 people? Do you want me to just shut shop and send them all home? What do I do? What do I do? I've got 160 people on my hands. What do I do with them all? I feel like I found the cure for cancer. You know, I just can't get anyone to listen. <laughs> 